Good morning. Welcome to worship. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, those of you who have chosen to be with us here in person, we are grateful to see your uh, smiling faces. I choose to assume that underneath that mask, you are smiling. And uh, it is Advent, and we welcome you to wait with us for the coming of Christ. And we're so glad that you're here. If you're tuned in online and you're watching with us, we're grateful that you're here with us too. Uh, I'd invite you to uh, share this uh, Share this broadcast so that uh, your friends can join in with you. Uh, also, um, you feel free to comment below. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to, to hear from you. And uh, if there's anything we can do for you, to serve you, to pray with you about, please comment down below. Uh, if you'd like more information about our church, 
please comment down below. We'd love to connect with you. Um, again, we are so glad that you are here. We are entering into the season of Advent. Uh, this is a time of waiting and preparation for the coming of Christ. Not only the baby born in Bethlehem, but Christ coming into our hearts and ultimately one day his return to make all things right and good. And so it is so good to see you. Thank you for being here to worship with us. As we move into a time of worship, uh, I want us to prepare our hearts through prayer. But before we do that, I've got a couple of housekeeping items I want to offer up to you. Um, you guys have been so incredibly uh, generous uh, throughout this season of COVID and the pandemic. We we have seen um, God's hand at work and your faithfulness and your generosity. Uh, one of the things that your generosity allows us to do is to, we've hosted uh food drops where we uh, uh, partner with an organization and uh, we purchase food for a very low cost and we're able to bring it here uh, to the church and distribute it to those in need of the, in the community. So if you are would like to pick up some of that food, if you're one who would like to uh, to be a part of receiving that, you can call the office or email us uh, at our church email address, which is fumclb at cable1.net, uh, or you can call the office, 228-863-9619. If you'd be interested in volunteering to help, because it comes in literally on pallets, and then we sort it out and box it up to distribute it, you can be here in this building right here uh, this Tuesday at 8 a.m. And so the drop will happen Tuesday morning, um, and we will distribute uh, sometime around uh, right before noon. So if you'd like to help with that, 8 a.m., if you're a college student, you're home now for a little while, and you're looking for something fun to do, come help us sort some food. Uh, it's for a great cause. One other thing, too, is uh, many of you picked up your Advent kit, uh, Advent wreath kit last week. Um, if you didn't, we still have plenty. So if you're here today and you want to get one, you can grab one on the way out. We have them. It's a box, and inside it, you'll find a devotional guide. You'll find an actual Advent wreath with some candles. Now, you're going to have to decorate it, and we invite you to do that and do it creatively. Also, we'd also invite you to post uh, your Advent wreath onto social media and tag us in it, please, because uh, we want to see what you do. You can put greenery. You can do all kinds of sorts of things. Um, we'd love to see that. And so if you're watching from home, hopefully you've got your candles out and uh, you've got it decorated. Uh, send, drop a picture in the comments below. Let us know uh, how you do it. And together we're going to light the Advent candle here in here today. And those of you who are here can light yours when you get home. Um, but uh, if you need one of those, you can pick one up on the way out. If you're watching online and you still want one, you're welcome to drop by the office and get one, or you can give us a comment below. We'll come and bring it to you. Just uh, connect with us, and we'd love to get one in your hands. Again, we're so grateful that you're here with us. Our theme for this Advent is incarnation. Uh, God chose to be with us, to put skin on and to come and dwell among us. And so your presence here uh, is, is greatly appreciated. Your presence online is greatly appreciated. Life is better when we do it together, and uh, God's Spirit is among us, and He is with us, and uh, I'm grateful to see you. I want to invite you to join your hearts with mine as we go to God in prayer this morning and prepare our hearts for worship. Let us pray. God, you are so, so good to us. When we were far from you, when we were living in sin and brokenness, when we were walking in darkness, you shined a light. You gave us hope. You gave us the greatest gift, your son Jesus. You put on flesh and you moved into the neighborhood. You became one of us so that you might lead us to salvation. God, we thank you for your son Jesus, for the gift of salvation that we celebrate not only at Easter, but we celebrate here at Christmas in his coming. And God, not only do we celebrate his coming, but we celebrate your coming into our lives your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And God, we also stand ready and waiting for your return when you make everything right. And so God, prepare our hearts this moment. May everything we say and do, even the very thoughts that we have, God, be, bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, may you be exalted. May your name be lifted high in all the world so that those who are far from you may draw near. Come and visit with us, we pray. Be among us. Be exalted. King Jesus. Amen.
You guys can be seated, and at this time, we're going to have the lighting of our Advent wreath. Good morning. I'm Renee. This is my daughter, Reagan, and my husband, Patrick, and we are the Phillips Tulme Ladner family. <laughs> Um, today we begin Advent, the season where we wait for the coming of Jesus. Each week until Christmas, we will light a candle in this Advent wreath. Today we're going to light the first candle, the candle of hope. If you're watching online, you can follow along with us and light your candle on your wreath when we light ours here. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire. Hope also carries an element of trust. We can hope in Jesus because we can trust him. Hope in Jesus is our guiding light, always leading us in the right direction. Hear those words from the prophets who foretold the coming of Jesus. From Micah chapter 5, verses 2 and 4. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one of who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. In Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, we read, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Finally, from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to us. He brings us hope and always leads us in the right direction. Help us to trust him and follow his light. In his name we pray. Amen.
you guys can have a seat. Um, in just a minute, we're going to have one of our kids' videos. And so, guys, we want you to stay in your seats and watch this video. And before you head out to the Well Junior, we're really excited about um, the videos. We're trying to tie in all of these ideas about hope and about light. I love the line in that song about how it says that God will pierce the clouds and bring us light. And just those images of, of what it might be, have been like to be in, in the darkness and to see a little glimmer of hope. Um, many of us may have thought about this past year and felt like we have been in a dark place and we would love to see the glimmer of hope that comes at Christmas and we're so excited to get to share that and worship together. I want to remind you if you're here with us on your way out, you can drop um, an offering in the baskets by the doors as you leave. If you're watching online, we'd love to invite you to give an offering um, and you can do, do that online by going to our website clicking on the giving, giving link there, or you can mail in a gift. Um, at, at this time of year, it's so important that we're generous to one another and we're taking care of the people around us, and we trust that you guys will do that. All right, um, let's say a prayer, and then let's watch this awesome video, and then our kids will head um, to Well Junior. You guys pray with me. God, I just pray that in this season that we would continue to see your light, and God, that you would come near to us, that you would find us in the dark places, and that you would bring us hope. We're so grateful for Jesus and for all all of the gifts that he gives us and for the meaning that he gives to our lives. And it's in his great name we pray. Amen. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. You probably know that song. It is about a star like me. Once upon a time, I was given a very important job of all these stars in the sky. God asked me to shine above a little town called Bethlehem. One particular night, a baby was born in Bethlehem. He was a small baby, but he was important. The baby name was Jesus. My job was to shine in the night that Jesus was born. Don't let my size fool you. I may be a small star, but I can shine brightly. I was so bright, I led the Mazarites on their way to Jesus. The Mazarites were some men from far away. They studied the stars. When they saw me appear, they knew something big happened. They decided to take a trip and bring to baby Jesus and bring him presents. I got to lead them the whole way to Jesus. When I stopped right over his house, the Mazarites were so happy. They worshiped him and gave him really fancy gifts. It was exciting for me to have such an important job. Even as I traveled in the darkness, my twinkling light led the way. A song that I was singing for them, they hoped that they would see Jesus. Did you know that Jesus was born to bring hope to the whole world? When the world was in darkness, Jesus was born to be the light to bring us back to his Father. Jesus even said, I am the light of the world. If you think I am bright, you should see Jesus. When you feel like you are in the dark, he will always lead you in the right direction. You should look at up in the sky and see these stars twinkle. They will be so bright. Let them remind you, even though it is dark, Jesus is the light of the world. Merry Christmas! That was so much fun. Uh, thank you, Bella, for uh, leading us so well. And uh, there's plenty more where that came from. So. Uh, we're excited about that. At this time, all of our children uh, can go with Miss Lori in the back uh, this way over here for Well Junior, and um, they will. Uh, you can pick your child up after the service right through uh, that corridor over there. And so, uh, yeah, we've. Uh, I, I got to sit in on some of the front end of the the kids stuff, so you want to make sure you don't miss 
those uh, week to week. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so we are, uh, we are finally in Advent. One other thing I didn't mention earlier, and I should have, um, is those of you who are here in person uh, have noticed that things look a little different around here. And uh, I hope you are as excited about it as I am. Um, I feel like it just feels so much better. And so for all of you who worked so hard, Jill Sanders had a team of people who spent a lot of time up here, and I wouldn't be able to name all of them, but uh, I'm grateful uh, for what they did to transform this space. Those of you who are watching online, you can see some of the stuff here behind me, but uh, it just feels a little bit more like Christmas, and so grateful for their uh, for their work to, to change and transform this space. And so uh, if y'all want to give them a round of applause, you can join with me. Um, it always, um, I don't know, I, I, it amazes me to think about all, all of what happens behind the scenes to make, uh, to, to make church happen. I mean, most importantly, obviously, God is with us, and uh, that's really all that matters. But so many people spend so much time uh, preparing, and uh, even as right now, we've got folks over here running cameras and sound and computers and all of that just to make this happen, and uh, we're grateful for what you guys do week after week after week. I just get to stand up here and do the easy part. And so thank you all for, uh, for what you do constantly, uh, even for our worship team uh, who consistently prepares and practices and strives for excellence uh, because they want to honor God with what they do. So I'm grateful to be a part of this. Uh, so anyways, all of that being said, we are now moving into a brand new sermon series centered around this Advent season. Um, God is with us. Uh, this idea of incarnation, that the Lord who created all that is put on flesh and, and became human to live among us, incarnate. That very word simply means uh, to put flesh on, usually referring to a, a deity, a God of some sort. And in our case, uh, the way we understand, the, the only God to put flesh on was Jesus. And uh, he put skin on, uh, incarnate. Uh, he became one of us. Um, the message translation of the Bible um, would, would read John chapter 1 as uh, the word made flesh uh, that God put skin on and moved into the neighborhood. And you think about that, that the God who created all that is became human. Uh, and, and what we want to do today as we open up this series is ask one very simple question about the incarnation, and that is why. Uh, you got to know why. And so, uh, so as we move into that, I want to I read you first a quote. And this is from a German uh, theologian, pastor, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, from, from years ago. He says this. He says, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. Let me read that one more time to you, and I want to just ask you to consider, like, do you fit into this category? I think it's a really bold statement for someone to say only those who fit into this category can celebrate Advent, but, but I wonder. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. That's me. That's me. And really, if you listen to the teachings of Jesus who was the incarnation. He said simply that we're those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, uh, those who, um, who are meek, those are the ones that the kingdom is for. And so in order for us to celebrate Advent, there's this call, there's this invitation into the waiting for those who are troubled in soul, for those who are poor and imperfect, and those who long for something greater to come. And I don't know what your year's been like. I don't know what your week was like. But here's what I know. Is that if we're really honest with ourselves, in the not so distant past, many of us can consider ourselves in desperate need for something greater. When we live in the flesh, when we walk this earth, when we live our lives day to day, there's, a, there's something missing. There's something that the world cannot satisfy for us and so we long and we wait for the full presence of Jesus with us and so I believe according to Mr. Bonhoeffer pastor theologian 
that we are at a place where we're ready to celebrate the incarnation. And I hope that you are too. And I hope that you will join with me to celebrate Advent, to take a moment to set aside and to wade into hope. That's what Advent is. Advent is simply a season or a moment of coming, awaiting for something that is yet to come. And many of you might say, well, didn't Jesus already come a whole bunch of years ago and really we just... Hello. Thank y'all for not getting up and leaving and for y'all hanging here with me. Let me get this off and we'll get right back on track. I promise. Sort of. Advent is that season of hoping and waiting. We know Jesus and that's where we were. We might say that didn't Jesus already come? But you see, during the season of Advent for, for years in the history of the church, this waiting on Jesus wasn't just waiting for the night of the 24th so we could celebrate the cute little cuddly baby wrapped in swaddling clothes who's lying in a manger. It's, it's that, but it's so much more. We also celebrate and we anticipate and we hope and we wait for the return of Christ. For one day, it is our hope, it is our faith that, that Jesus will return and restore everything to himself. That all that is wrong will be right, all that is crooked will be made straight, all that is dark will be made light. And so we live in sort of this in-between in stage. In fact, dare I say that our whole life is an advent, it's a waiting for the coming of Christ. But also in a very personal way, we anticipate the coming of Christ into our very own lives in a very personal and transformative way. And so as we begin this journey together, we are waiting, we're expecting, we're hoping for something greater to come. And as we do so, we're going to be looking at this idea of the incarnation, this putting on of flesh, this embodiment of deity, this God in a body. And we're going to take a moment, we're going to take the next several weeks to sort of break this down. But before we do, I want us to simply ask one simple question, one simple question. And before we get there, I want to invite you to, uh, to share in some scripture with me. And we're going to begin with John chapter 1. And you'll actually, believe it or not, hear this again before we finish our Advent journey. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And this is John's account of the coming of Jesus. He says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. He created, he created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light. So that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He simply was a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical, re physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So, so the Word became flesh. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The Word became flesh the one who created everything that is the one who with a breath spoke you and I into being and the, the trees and the heaven and the, the stars everything that is came from the will of Jesus as he existed long before he put skin on 
And yet, because of our brokenness, because of his redemptive purpose, Jesus steps out of heaven. The word becomes flesh and lives among people like me and you. The word became flesh and lived among us. He brings great light. He brings hope. He brings an answer to the problem. And so what I want us to do as we begin this journey together is to ask one simple question. And it's a question that you've probably asked about many other things, and perhaps you've even asked this question about Jesus and about the incarnation and Advent. But I want us to ask it again and again and again. And the question is simply why. And, and we ask this question, and I don't know about you, but uh, I get that, asked that question often, especially when it comes to any level of instruction I'm offering to my children. I get the question, well, why? Or maybe if I'm asked to do something by my beloved spouse, maybe I'm asking the question myself, why? And, and here's what I want you to understand. The why actually matters. Now, sometimes my answer to my children is just because I said so. And 98% of the reason I say that is just because that's what my parents said to me, and it feels really good to finally offer that up to somebody else, right? <laughs> but when we know the why behind the what, the what means something totally different. For example, I always everything goes back to food for me. Take your wild guess why. But anyways, I like it. If you tell me, Ben, I want you to cook breakfast, right? Around our house on any given morning, I'm probably like heating up, you know, something out of the freezer that's going to, you know, just get them off to school, right? But if you tell me it's Christmas Eve or Christmas Day that morning and you say, by the way, you know, it's Christmas Day, I want you to fix breakfast, right? It means something totally different. Because one, the reason why is they just need to eat and get off to school, right? On the other hand, it's Christmas Day, and we're celebrating big today. It's a big day, and we're going to sit down at the table, and we're all going to sit there together at the same time. And we're going to reflect, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to read from Luke chapter 2. I mean, we're, we're going to cover it all, right? And so you can't do that with a Pop-Tart or some toast. you got to have bacon. and it's Read up. It's in there. I promise. I'm kidding. When you know the why behind the what, it changes everything. You know, when it, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to doing other things, when it comes to your job, your place of employment, you know that if it's just do this, you know, it's one thing to go through the motions. But if there's a real reason behind it, a redemptive purpose, all of a sudden it just feels different. You follow me? When it came, you know, I think back most recently, cleaning up after uh, this hurricane we had in my own yard, we drug some leaves and some limbs to the road, and it was fairly tedious, and it wasn't very exciting, and it felt really pointless at times. But when you go do that at someone else's home who can't do that for themselves, John and I got to visit with a, a gentleman, he and his, both, he and his wife both, uh, unconnected to our church, had serious health problems, They're desperate for somebody to come help them pick up some limbs. Picking up limbs and raking leaves at their house looks a whole lot different because when you have a different reason why behind it, there's a better understanding of the what. And so when it comes to the incarnation, we can talk about our God became flesh, and sometimes that rolls off the tongue, and I don't think we even realize how miraculous and how incredible that really is, especially for a people who were not really hoping for a God to be made flesh. They wanted a God to do what they wanted them to do and just make stuff happen. And I think sometimes we get caught in the middle of that, we see God as someone who lives on high and who reigns from above and yet has no connection or understanding of who we are living down here. And so we just simply, our lives are meant to be uh, filled with the bidding of the God and we try to do things that would sort of help the stars line up to get what we want out of life and out of whatever, relationships, anything. In fact, I think even sometimes if we're real honest, we get to a point where we think God is so removed from, from our day-to-day. -day. Let's be honest. Sometimes we think God is so removed from our day-to-day, -day, it's not that we would say he doesn't care. Perhaps he's just not interested. Perhaps he's just not really concerned with what's going on in my life and in your life 
on the day-to-day. And therefore, what I do on a day-to-day doesn't really affect what God thinks about me or does for me or does with me or through me, in me, etc. And I think if we consider the why behind the what, it begins to look different. We consider why it is that God put flesh on and moved into the neighborhood. And so to help us understand that, I want to first start with a, a passage from the prophet Isaiah. And you'll hear us talk, you've already heard some of Isaiah earlier in the, uh, in the Advent reading. And you'll hear some more of Isaiah as we travel through this journey. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. This is years before Jesus shows up on the scene. But Isaiah was called by God to give a word from God to the people of God. And if ever there were a people walking in darkness, so to speak, these were those people. The, the people of Israel had, had failed so many times and they had sold themselves out and they had refused to trust in God and they were disobedient and they were literally walking in darkness and they were experiencing the brokenness of all of their decisions. And so the prophet Isaiah was assigned by God, was called by God to basically call them out on their brokenness, to, to speak to them the truth, to prophesy, to explain to them what the problem really was. And, and, and you can read for yourself all throughout Isaiah of, of the, this account, uh, and then there's this shift where the hope comes. Don't worry, we'll get there too. But just beginning in the first verse of the first chapter of Isaiah, hear, hear what the Lord says through Isaiah to the people of Israel and be listening for the question of why. These are the visions of, that Isaiah the son of Amoz saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He saw these visions during the time or during the years when Uzziah, when Uzziah get up here where I can read it, He saw these visions during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. And here's what he says. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even the ox knows its owner, and the donkey recognizes its master's care, but Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Oh, what a sinful nation they are, loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil people, corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. This gets off to a raring start. They've despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured and your heart is sick. You are battered from head to foot, covered with bruises and welts and infected wounds without soothing ointments or bandages. Your country lies in ruins and your towns are burdened. Foreigners plunder your fields before your eyes and destroy everything they see. Beautiful Jerusalem stands abandoned like a watchman's shelter in a vineyard. Like a lean-to in a cucumber field after the harvest, like a helpless city under siege. If the Lord of heaven's armies had not spared a few of us, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah. Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. What makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord. I'm sick of your burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fattened calves. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls or lambs or goats when you come to worship me. Who asked you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. This is not going well. God says through the prophet Isaiah, I've had enough. You have rejected, you have gone away, you have pushed away, pushed back, and I'm over it. Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they're all sinful and false. I won't know more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual event, your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. 
When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice and help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If you will only obey me, I, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you'll be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. Well, that's a very cheery introduction to the Christmas season, am I right? And we could keep reading. It goes on and on and on. But what I want you to understand is that the place that Israelites found themselves in, the people of God found themselves literally walking in darkness. And I don't know what life's like for you, and, 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 and I don't want to paint too grim of a picture for the season that we're walking through uh, because I, I really, I mean, things are rough and things are tough. Perhaps they aren't quite as bad as the situation that's facing the Israelites. But nonetheless, the real issue here was that there was sin present in the people of God. There was separation between the people of God and God. There was this great gap. And God had given them boundaries. He had given them prophets. He had given them um, judges. He had, he had given them everything, kings, whatever they asked for. And yet still... They could not, they could not make a way. They could not come up with a way to salvation on their own. They could not abide by the law in such a way that would bring the freedom that God ultimately wanted for them. Recently, we were doing a, a study on the whole of Scripture, just the, the, the six basic movements of Scripture. And one of the first things out of the gate we discovered was that as followers of Jesus, as, as, as creation, we were created by God out of community, this fellowship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're created out of that, and the purpose was for community, that we would live life loving God and loving neighbor. That's who we're made to be. If you trim all, away all the fat and get down to the basics, you and I are called by God to live in a faithful and obedient, loving relationship with him, and to love and serve our neighbor as we would do for ourselves. That's who we're called to be. And yet for years and years, we can't seem to get it right. For all of human history, we have failed and failed and failed. And so, Jesus comes down. God would not settle to see Israel, to see his people, to see humanity fail time and time again. And so, a little later, we get a little bit of an ounce, a word of hope from Isaiah. And if you look in chapter 9, you'll read this. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 9. We'll begin in the first verse. Nevertheless, which is always, after reading something like we just read, is always a nice, a nice ring to it. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Hear this. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who, for those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice they will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire for a child is born to us. A son given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. So when you ask the question, why? Why did God need to put on flesh? Why did we need rescuing? Number one problem is sin. It always has been and it continues to be. The one thing that separates God from his people. And I'm on my third microphone now. How about that one? I can't be outdone. Sin has always been the problem. Sin has always been the problem. Sin is simply when we choose to, to completely ignore what God would have for us or from us and do what we would do and desire on our own. And sin, the product of sin is always separation from God. The product of sin is always separation from God. And if we're created for and from commu- out of community, There's no way we can live in communion with God and communion with one another and still live in a life of sin, which which leads us always to separation. Anytime there's separation, there cannot be communion. And so sin, sin is the why. But that's not enough. That's not enough. I want to offer to you one, one other thing. The other why that God would put on flesh, yes, there's sin and it needs to be addressed. But, but if you think about it, and again, we're thinking human terms of a godly figure. If I was God, which is a really dangerous thing to say or even think at times, if, if you want to keep walking away, and again, I'm just a broken, a broken person, I'm going to look at you and say goodbye. And so not only does our sin choose to separate us and therefore create the need for some kind of rescue or redemption, But perhaps the most important piece of the why is not so much that the sin needed saving or the sinner needed saving, that the that the brokenness needed fixing and healing, that the darkness needed light. But the reason behind all of that is the great love that God has for humanity. That that was enough of a driving force that caused the father to let go of the son, that caused the son to step out of heaven, to put on skin to choose, willingly limit himself and become human and live among us, and not just to live among us, but to give his life as ransom for many. So there's a twofold why. Why do we need the incarnation? Because we're broken and sinful people. Why do we need the incarnation? Because we have a loving God who is not willing to sit and let us go away. I want to read to you another passage, and this is from Romans chapter 5. This is going way ahead from Isaiah. This is after Jesus has shown up. He's taught, preached. Paul met Jesus blinded by the light of Christ in a good way. And, and his life is now new. And he's, he's starting churches, planting churches. And he's writing to us and explaining as best he understands who this man named Jesus is and was. And in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, we read this. As we attempt to understand the why behind God coming to us. He says, when we were utterly helpless, Paul says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would, be, would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. Let me read that one more time. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. If you want to ask the question, this is the answer. If you want to know why, yes, we are broken. But no matter our brokenness, no matter the sin, and and it is great, it is great. The love of God surpasses all of our sin and brokenness and leads him to a place to give us the gift of his son. While we were yet sinners, 
God showed great love. If you want to know why, if you want to know why the incarnation, our brokenness is met with the radical love of a father who created you, who knows you, who knows all about you, who knows your faults, who knows your failures, who knows your gifts, and loves you even still. Even still to the point of pulling out all the cards for this rescue operation that began with his son putting on skin, moving into the neighborhood so that he might redeem the world. If you want to know, if you want to know the why, I just invite you to look at Jesus on the cross. While he is being devastated, by the physical pain, by the emotional separation from his father, by the weight of my sin and yours, even in that moment, even in that moment, has the love and the grace to look at those who are spitting at him, who are calling him a liar, who are saying he's crazy, and say, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what's happening here. Forgive them, for they have no idea what is going on here. That's a glimpse into the why of the incarnation. Our brokenness was severe, but his love was greater. And God has come near to us, moved into the neighborhood, and it makes all the difference. It's the only way we would be rescued. It's the only way we would be made whole. That while we were yet sinners, Christ came near out of the great love of the father he sends the son out of the great love of the son he submits and surrenders and limits himself to live among us and to give his life as a ransom for many as we journey through this advent season we're going to pick apart this idea of god putting on skin and as we do i hope that we discover all along the way the depth and the width and the breadth of this love that he has for us and I hope that you and I are never the same. I want to remind you once again, I want to invite you once again on this journey. On this journey where Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say, all aboard to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who seek or who look forward to something greater to come. His name is Jesus. He is God in the flesh. He wants to rescue you and rescue me. Would you follow him? Will you wait for him? Will you expect and prepare for his coming into your life? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you are willing to step out of heaven. Father, we thank you for sending us the gift of your son for the hope that we have, for the light that comes in darkness. God, we don't, we attempt to talk about it, but we really do, we know why. I don't know what would drive such a love in the midst of such brokenness. We have turned from you, we have failed you, we have ignored your will for our life, and yet you still draw near. And so come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Heal our brokenness. Help our hearts to sing and to acknowledge your goodness. And may our lives be a reflection of the salvation that you offer to us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that we will see you back again um, next Sunday, either in this room or online, when we continue to celebrate and um, looking forward to Christ coming again. Thank you so much, and have a great week.